welcome everybody to another episode of Point of Jew. Uh, my guest this week is really just, I, I think, one of the smartest guys I've talked to thus far. That's, that's not to insult anyone else. Um, but he's an engineer. Uh, he's an applications engineer and additive manufacturing. He's a YouTube channel where he shows off 3D printing and uh, 3D scanning. And he's made some really cool stuff. And, you know, as a gigantic nerd, uh, I've seen him do some like Star Wars stuff, um, some Star Trek things. And Star Trek we'll end up talking about very briefly. Um, it's kind of one of the motivating factors that got him interested, you know, in uh, 3D printing. So that was kind of cool just because of, I guess, like, I'm going to butcher this because I don't remember off top, but like the, the replicator stuff. I'm a nerd, but I'm not a Star Trek nerd. I'm like Marvel nerd, uh, Star, uh, Star Wars over, over the Trek. I'm not sure if that's going to cause any, uh, any battles. Um, but yeah, just the, the subject matter is just extremely interesting. And I know I'm hyping it up, but uh, genuinely speaking, um, you know, he's a passionate guy and he, you know, maybe just from having the videos and explaining to people and a large portion of what he does, um, you know, is talking to people. Um, so definitely um, somebody that's easy to speak to and the way he relays the information um, is very relatable and very digestible on a topic that could definitely sort of, you know, span out of control. He's not one of the, I don't know how many engineers you guys talk to, um, but, you know, sometimes can get kind of heady, um, you know, with industry jargon and stuff like that. So very easy conversation, very good to talk to. And I think it's something that you guys will genuinely enjoy. Um, all right, everybody, welcome to Point of Jew. Uh, my guest today, Andrew Sink. Andrew is a applications engineer, a background in additive manufacturing, uh, CAD designer, um, proponent of 3D printing technology, and he has his own YouTube channel, uh, showing off that 3D printing. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, absolutely, Jeremy. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'm really excited to talk about stuff. Well, stuff and things is usually kind of uh, the world that uh, I partake in. So, um, you know, firstly, in terms of your background, uh, we used to work together at an engineering company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, tell us a little bit of, about your background as an engineer, kind of, you know, clue people in as, as to what your background is and what you do. Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Andrew Sink, and I have been, I saw my first 3D printer in 2012, and it was just one of those moments where it was the clearest thing in the world to me, like, oh, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, because this thing is basically magic. Um, and seeing somebody make a CAD design and send it to the printer, and then like the same day they were holding the thing that they were looking at on the computer, and it was just a mind-blowing experience for me. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world and flash forward eight years later that hasn't changed like still every time i start a print i have to watch the first layer go down like man that's cool and so it's just it's like it is a absolutely wild technology i'm a huge star trek fan so of course the, the replicator in star trek the idea of just walking up to something and saying you know phillips head screwdriver and then you know it just pops out like <laughs> to me this is like we're on that path like we're getting there really quick well, yeah, I mean, a lot of great inventions kind of stem from you saw something similar in science fiction, and then, you know, people who get excited about it want to replicate that technology in the real world. So there has been a lot that science fiction has sort of bestowed upon humanity just by sparking that interest and that, you know, desire to do that like it did for you. Yeah, and it's just, it's such a cool thing to be a part of. And I feel like I got in right when it was starting to kind of take off. So the first 20 years or so of additive manufacturing were mostly, uh, it was used in prototyping. It wasn't really, it was, um, it, was, it was just more of like a generalist thing. It was used for like a handful of applications and the materials were all sort of the same. There wasn't a lot of diversity in how it worked. And I feel like I got in and there was kind of that explosion in 2014 um, when Stratasys bought MakerBot and all of a sudden there, every day there was like a new headline about 3D printed guns, right? And like yeah. my, my grandmother who lived in, in Queens, um, it, you know, she'd never seen a 3D printer. She didn't know anything about them. And she called me because she knew that I used them. And she goes, I just saw something on the news. You're not making guns, are you? And it's just, you know, the, the, uh, the amount of public recognition, like all of a sudden everybody saw the printer and they had the same reaction I had. Um, and so I saw it when I was in college and it was kind of like, oh, it's kind of a specialized tool. It's like an oscilloscope or something where, you know, if you've got a use for it, it makes sense that you would know what it is, but to like your average dude on the street, it, you know, they're, they're like, okay, so, you know, what am I, what am I going to do with this? Yeah. 
and there seems to be a ton of practical applications. I mean, on your YouTube channel, I've seen you make stuff, uh, Star Wars, Star Trek related things, uh, Steven Universe related things. And you've done like, what, like headphones, like a, a brain replica, a rubber band gun, I think a, a USB drive. And that's not even, I think, scratching the surface of the kind of things that you've kind of uh, done and played around with. Yeah, no, the YouTube channel was just because I, um, you know, I studied technical writing and technical communication in college. And my, the, the thing that I really enjoy the most is process documentation and explaining, okay, here's this sort of complex thing let's break it apart and then show it to people in a way where somebody coming into this completely cold would understand. And so 3d printing, that was sort of like, Oh, okay. It, it's sort of an, there's like an abstract layer between what the machine is doing and, and what you have to do to get it to work. And I felt like, okay, we need to kind of explain from the beginning how this process works. So I started making videos cause it just seemed like a natural extension of, okay, I want to talk to people about this and they don't have a solid, you know, it, it's hard to kind of like, okay, well in the beginning, there were dimension sketches before there was CAD and you have to kind of start from there. So it's been nice to talk about stuff I'm working on. And I'm very much a, um, somebody who enjoys working on many different types of things. So of course, the YouTube channel, like you said, I've, I had an MRI done and they gave me a scan of my brain. So I printed that. And, um, I just printed a tree recently. I went out, uh, for a walk and there was a really cool looking tree. My girlfriend and I stopped and I scanned it. And now I've got this like pencil holder, that's got pine wood <laughs> bark <laughs> on it. So, I mean, you, you really could just print about almost anything, right? Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, definitely when I started it, mostly you were looking at people who were making things out of plastic and there wasn't a whole lot of, of um, thought to, to, to dive into different materials. And now it's, it's kind of crazy how far it came, how fast. Um, and I think a big part of that is just adoption. And, and like you hear 3D printing, um, you see it in movies now. You know, like every, like every so often you'll see, I just watched a movie called Knock Knock on uh, Netflix. It's like a horror movie with Keanu like Reeves. Reeves. Yeah. Yeah. And he's just like, in the beginning of the movie, he's like an architect and he's just using a 3D printer. Like, it's just there. He's like on his laptop and he's, he's making a sketch up, like he's designing a building and the camera pans over and he's got a printer next to him and the printer is printing the thing he had on the screen. That's incredible. It must, I mean, you know, it's gone from science fiction to science fact. And now, you know, getting to see that representation in movies, what types of materials, um, I know you mentioned plastics a little bit before, and I know, I know it's leaning towards metal as well. What types of materials can 3D printers work with and, you know, where are they kind of evolving to? Sure. The short answer is if you can squeeze it into a tube, and then squeeze it out of that tube, you can probably 3D print it. So like, it's really kind of everything. So that's like, when, when we think of 3D printers, we think of making things out of plastic. Uh, one of the coolest applications, there's a group at Penn State right now that's working on building habitats that are designed to be built in place on Mars. Oh, and wow. so they use a process called in situ resource utilization, ISRU, meaning you use whatever you have around. So when you land on Mars, you're gonna have a lot of Mars dust. So how can we take advantage of that and turn that into basically concrete to print out a shelter? And that's exactly what they did. <laughs> that's crazy. So then with that, I'm assuming they also have to kind of cre not recreate the technology, but basically make retro purpose a, a 3D printer to also function in that type of lands or landscape or is that something that they can kind of scale down to, to use on shuttlecraft or, or send up there? Or how does that even work? Exactly. So like, that's exactly where it gets kind of fun. And that's, this is another one of the things that's just like super exciting. A 3D printer is basically a hot glue gun attached to like a really precise Etch-A-Sketch. That's, oh, wow. that's pretty much the whole thing. Like you've got two motors that are controlling where the head goes and, and then you've got a head that's depositing something. And so with that in mind, you can make a 3D printer that's designed for biology that's printing out you know, single cell structures, or you can just scale it up and now you're printing concrete or um, you know, Mars cement. <laughs> and like, you're sort of, you're, you're making these, these things out of the same process, but the idea behind it of, okay, start here, move to here, and then extrude material the whole time, like start to finish, it's pretty much the same thing. That's absolutely crazy. And you, and you mentioned a second ago in terms of like cells and things in terms of biology, is there a lot of medical applications that are currently of use of it or is it leaning that way as well? Or, or what's that looking like too? Yeah, it's one of those, it's 
the thing that I've learned is if somebody asks you a question about 3D printing, like, can it do X? The answer is always yes, but. <laughs> and so like most technology, like we figured out a lot of stuff, like can you print a circuit board? Sure. Can you print a brain? Like you can make a plastic one. I wouldn't want to have it in my head right now. But like the, um, the brain, for example, is actually kind of, a cool, um, kind of a cool example. I had an MRI done because they were looking for a tumor which they didn't find, which is good news. <laughs> so they, uh, they scanned it, and then they printed it, and then they, they were looking at the results and going through everything. And I was looking at the MRI scan, and I'm like, oh, it's just a bunch of slices. And they take a bunch of pictures at different slices, and then you can sort of stack them up later. And I'm like, that's sort of like the 3D printing in reverse, right? Like you're taking all the stacks that they're making, and I can just turn those back into a brain. But one of the things that hospitals are doing now is if they find a tumor, for instance, in a brain, they can print that out with that tumor embedded in it so the doctor can practice surgery on it and open it up and take a look at it before it gets to the point where they're actually operating on you. So by the time they're coming to you, it's like round two or three, they've practiced a little bit. Which but is, I want them to have practice if it's You me. want them to have practice. And like all the medical models are kind of like generic, like the tumor is always in the same spot. And it's like, it's like running an obstacle course or something that like, or like a, um, like, like those triumph things, I think the triumph in Richmond where like you go like zip lining and stuff. It's like the obstacle course doesn't change. <laughs> so like you don't really learn anything new on the second time through. But if you're practicing on, you know, a real patient's brain, for instance, or heart, um, we, there's a 3D printer here in um, one of the hospitals in Charlotte, North Carolina. And that's exactly what they do. They actually print out, um, it's in a pediatric unit, they print out hearts and then they, you know, mock operate on them. That is crazy. I think I've also seen some hospitals around the country utilizing it for uh, like prosthetics, like artificial limbs. Like I think I've seen people like print out like Iron Man arms for amputees and like things like that. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Melville actually on Twitter, he just had, um, oh my gosh, what did he have? The, the Metal Gear Solid 5, the solid arm, like the red one with like the gold stuff on it. Um, he just had one of those printed out and it was like a big thing. Konami posted it on Twitter and like, it's so cool, man. Like, <laughs> It's, it's crazy how far that stuff has come. Where do you think in terms of, it may be, it may be the case is the sky's the limit. Is there any limitations you think you think will get, uh, you know, fully replaceable organs and just, I guess they're already doing limbs. So I can't go back to the limbs thing, but you know, is the practical application essentially then limitless? And I know you like to say yes to anything a 3d printer can do. It's yes, but. Yes, so but. the answer so the answer is like yes but so could you 3d print like a heart with working cells like maybe but like yes in theory but has anybody done it is it practical you know is it gonna be cost effective like those are all things that kind of have to get sorted out later so for 3d printing organs and stuff like sure i th it's probably possible and i'm sure within our lifetimes i guarantee we're gonna read that headline but it's just a matter of like you know when is it gonna happen you know how how is it gonna happen the logistics that, that, that part has to be sorted out. I've also, I've, I've seen things too in rumblings in terms of like 3D printers, but for food, is that, mm -hmm. is that an effective uh, methodology in producing food? Maybe a, an eventual, uh, you know, uh, answer to world hunger. Yes, but. Yes, but. So like, you've got it already. Like, this I'm is like, you could do what up. I do. You just like smile and nod a bunch. You're like, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, no, food uh, definitely is a short answer. Um, you can print food, but then the question is, is it cost effective to print it? Because first you have to render it into a state that it could be printed. So for instance, there's one of these printers back here is like earmarked for a project that I'm working on and trying to add like a, basically a ball screw to a syringe so you can 3D print a uh, pancake batter. So uh -huh. there's already like, you can go on Amazon right now and buy a pancake 3D printer that actually prints out like a pancake. And it's just, it looks like a 3D printer except it's putting out, you know, a pancake mix. And then, um, and then it turns, into the, it turns into a hot plate. Then you flip it over and there's your pancake. But the, the thing is like, is that more cost effective than if I wanted to like feed a hundred people? Does it make more sense to 3D print a hundred pancakes or to like just get a big bag of pancake mix, right? And put it on like a conventional oven. Well, that's true. The, 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 co the cost effectiveness of anything is going to be a, a given, but I, I was just thinking in terms of you know, whether it's there or getting there in terms of ease, because you can mass produce essentially something perhaps a lot quicker than a team of people. Uh, I would imagine ingredients still got to be the same, you know, uh, matter is matter, but. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's, I think that it's definitely 
somebody brought up the idea of 3D printing uh, pills in medicine, and I think that makes perfect sense because there is an example of, like you said, if you have your matter is matter, you've got your 10 different um, ingredients, and you know how these are all being mixed together, and the capsule itself is interchangeable. There's no reason why one machine couldn't spit out you know, thousands of different capsules mixing those ingredients. Um, and as far as food goes, it's been a personal goal of mine for, for since like 2014 or something like that. I've always wanted to 3D print a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because you can print the dough, right? Like you can extrude dough as a paste, you can extrude peanut butter, and you can extrude jelly. So like, there's no reason why you couldn't do it. I just, I've never been in a position until very recently where I'm like, okay, I've got enough time to work on this. So that's my, I'm hoping to hit the end of 2020 with a, a printed peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And is that going to be on the channel? Of course. Yeah, oh. totally. So you, you have such a passion for this. You love explaining everything. And it, it, did that naturally just kind of feed into, uh, and I know you, you did technical communication, you were saying, but did that kind of feed into the creativity and learning how to push, you know, and make these videos? Because there's a, there's a tremendous, besides technical flair, and people tend to not merge technical and artistic necessarily in, into the into the same lane but your youtube channel does marry very nicely like it, it's tremendously well done you know puts my editing or lack thereof to shame it's like a, it's a beautifully produced they're beautifully produced videos and then very scientific i mean it, it's not necessarily the same material but you know it, it reminds me like people love love learning i mean like who didn't grow up on like bill nye for argument's sake so you seem excited by that. Go ahead. I, I love Bill Nye. Like, who doesn't love Bill Nye? But, I mean, if you want to make yourself feel better about it, like, just go watch my first video. Like, it was awful. It was super loud. There's, like, I had my mic turned up so high. You can hear traffic, and I'm inside. <laughs> and, like, I, and, like, I had no idea how to make music. And, like, the first couple of videos I made, like, uh, my girlfriend was like, what were you thinking when she listens to them? Because, like, the music, like, you'll hear me talking, and I'm like, blah, blah, blah. And the music is just, like, definitely loud. There's one where there's a there's a the top comment on it, but like hundreds of likes is uh the music needs to be much much louder. <laughs> like uh, one guy said it made me nauseous. So like you know it's one of those things where like anything else, my first five were awful, the next ten were like a little better, and then you know six years later, like I finally feel like okay, I know how to use Final Cut, like I know how to edit stuff. Um, I eventually got myself like a decent camera. But, you know, like, those first ones were, were kind of experiments. And so, like, as far as, like, like your editing skills, like, dude, it's, like, this is how, this is how it starts. Like, you, you st like, I have seen, there's a, one of the biggest 3D printing YouTubers, uh, a guy named Chuck Hellebuck, films and edits on an iPad on a stand. <laughs> like, so, and, and it works. So, it's, it's totally just, like, you know, it's just getting comfortable with it. It's embarrassing. So my, my background is in mass communications where I was in editing bays and editing suites using Final Cut Pro every day of my of my college career. And then it's it's not quite like riding a bicycle because when you haven't done something in 10 or 15 years, the technology then changes. So bye bye in terms of skill sets, you can know where buttons are and kind of tip your toes back into it, but it gets different. And I use I currently use a program called DaVinci, which can actually, uh, I mean, mirror Final Cut, essentially. You can set up the operation to mirror other editing programs. And, you know, the beauty of YouTube and, like, things that you do is there are definitely people who are very well-versed in, in a wide array of subject matter and are happy to put videos out to show you, and so you can kind of walk those paths. So that's about the point where I'm at right now. Um, but you know, that's, that's why I do that, but it, it's just, it's impressive to see how tremendous, you know, your, your, your channel is, um, you know, marrying, like I was saying, you know, just artistic creativity and then just merging in, you know, information and, and sure. engineering. And it, it's tremendous to watch has, and I, and I know you said you've gotten better as you've done things. My head is just getting bigger as you're saying all this. <laughs> my, my job as the host of this horrible podcast is to just boost the ego of my guests. I think. It's working. It's working. Right now, I'm sitting here like, I'm number one. <laughs> Every guest leaves 10% to 30% more arrogant than when they came out <laughs> before they came on. That's just perfect. Those are the numbers. Um, I'll have a statistician double check that. But, you know, has there been sort of, I'm trying to think how to phrase this, has there been sort of just the desire to, to keep up with, with the channel and keep growing it and keep putting in that artistic energy 
just out of, out of you know, um, a duty to, to the people watching? Or is it something that, you know, is it now also a duty to yourself or a mixture of that? Or, you know, what, what fuels that growth in that channel for you? 100% it is, I'll put videos on there when I'm excited about something. And if I'm not excited about something, I don't. And so there's actually, if you look at like, I don't know, Social Blade or whatever, like if you like look through all the uploads and everything, um, I straight up took a two year break from YouTube, <laughs> like 2018 to like March, 2020 or so. I was just like, I don't feel like it. <laughs> and so I just, I just didn't upload. Um, and I hit like 10,000 subs and then I'm like, all right, you know, like I've got other stuff going on. I got to work on, you know, something else. And, and I kind of came back to it. And I think a big part of it is people can tell, right? Like if you're doing something and there, there was a, a video a while ago I watched for, um, like a piece of like technical equipment, like an oscilloscope or a voltmeter or whatever. And I was watching, like you said, like a YouTube video. Cause when you want to learn, you go to YouTube and you Google, you know, how do I fix a lawnmower? And then you watch some guy explain how to fix the lawnmower. <laughs> um, and I was watching this video and this guy looked like behind the camera, somebody was like holding a gun. Like he looked so nervous. Oh. He looked miserable. I felt so bad because it wasn't edited at all. So he likes, you know, he was stuttering. He was super nervous. And I felt bad because it's like, this is, you can tell this was a decision made like a couple levels up, right? This is not somebody who's waking up in the morning, like I'm going to crush it on YouTube today. <laughs> this is somebody who's like, I have to get in front of a camera or I'm going to lose my job, you know? And it's hard talking in front of people. Some people really like getting up in front of a group of people and talking. And some people they get it's very intimidating. Like it's really nerve wracking and YouTube, you are talking to the entire world. And there's a lot of mean people out there. <laughs> so like, if you're not ready for that instant YouTube comment of somebody going like, nice face, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it can, it can totally, it can totally wear you down, right? So Absolutely. I think that's part of the reason that I'm, I've seen any success at all, which is like very debatable if I have, <laughs> but I have a couple of fun videos, but I think it's just because I really enjoy it. And it's, it's something that I do because I feel like I want to, and I'm not, I don't feel like a, a social or societal pressure to like, you got to crush it on YouTube. You're not an influencer on Instagram. You got to keep up appearance. No. And you, you're, the passion in your videos really does shine through. I just do this because I love to, I love the sound of my own voice. I just like to hear myself talk, you know, uh, the, the wonderful conversations and learning about different subject matter is just completely and utterly secondary. Um, I was just listening to the podcast you did earlier with the, the horror movie producers and like they were talking about a horror movie with William Shatner in it. And I was like, Oh my God, I got to look this up. <laughs> There's little nuggets in the things. And that's what makes doing this, you know, exciting for me is just, I, I learn all these nuggets and hear all these things. And I love being inundated with information. It's absolutely like why I do this. I love to talk to people and hopefully that shines through. Don't know, but you know, it, it's, it's my greatest joy and I love to help people out. So Based on that too, one thing I love to ask guests is, you know, let's say somebody is interested in engineering or somebody's interested, you know, doing CAD or 3D printing. What is your advice for somebody? You know, obviously it takes a lot of dedication and school and just picking things up and, and getting hands on with it. But what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's maybe watching this, maybe, you know, still in school, figuring out what to do? Like I have a, I have a nephew who, you know, is interested in engineering because he thinks, you know, 3D printing and CAD and stuff is awesome. So what kind of advice would you, would you give to somebody like that? Loaded questions. No, no, it's awesome. That, that's a great question because it is like, it, it, there are, the first thing I would say right off the bat is it is a multifaceted world out there. And this is not a, I think that we've really moved past the, there's a very traditional mindset, especially in engineering, that there's a very set career path. You graduate, you get your undergraduate, you get a master's, you go to work as like a systems analyst, you go to work as, you know, uh, like a, a systems engineer. And like, that's kind of like your career path. And that's what you do. Um, but there's so much more to these technical fields. So there's all kinds of copywriting. There's all kinds of video content creation. Um, there's a tremendous amount of, of, of stuff that goes into making something. And I think what I would tell anybody who's interested in getting into any technical field is before we even talk about like, career stuff it's what do you like like what's exciting to you what do you want to do um i before i got into this stuff my original when i was in college um i studied music theory originally 
and I was a double bassist. And so that was like, I was like, this is it. I'm going to study music theory. I'm going to, you know, join a symphony and my life's going to like, like that's the path. And I so that turned into, I found out what I was really doing is I designed my own um, synthesizers and circuit boards and, and guitar pedals and stuff like that. I had a lot of fun doing it, but I was like, oh man, I really, I enjoy that part more than the like performance. I enjoy building stuff. And then that kind of naturally segued into 3D printing. Um, and that's, I switched majors and I was like, all right, this is more what I'm interested in. But it really, you know, you really have to find out like what's interesting to you. And that's, I would tell anybody who's interested in getting into any technical field, figure out what it is that you want to do and then find the job that fits. Like don't get a job in engineering just because that's like the thing you feel obligated to. That is such a crazy story. I, I didn't know you had a background with music whatsoever. I, maybe maybe we should uh, throw some solid works at the the conductor I interviewed. Maybe he's a, no, definitely kidding on that. He's I definitely so I watched that too, and all I could think was like, man, there's so many cool. I've seen so many cool 3D printed instruments and stuff. And like I feel like anybody, regardless of what instrument you play, again, it's just like you know I've so what have I like? There's Back here on the shelf, I've got a 3D printed keyboard that like the whole thing, the keys, the enclosure, everything except the speaker is 3D printed and like the circuit board. And like, uh, you could, it's just, again, it's, it's, there's, there's really a limitless world out there. And if you decide that you want to get into like a technical field and you also want to play the violin, like, guess what? Like you can get into designing amplifiers for violins. Like that's a career path that's available that kind of marries those things together. It's just so, it's just so incredible. What, what is, what is the craziest thing in your opinion that you have printed so far and what kind of, not, not to, uh, not to make a joke of it, but what designs do you have in the future in terms of like, what do you, what do you see yourself uh, besides the, the, the PB and J sandwich, you know, that's a big one that, I mean, that takes priority. I'm interested in eating the 3d printed peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So in terms of what you've done already, what's like the craziest thing? Like if some, if somebody's perusing your channel, what's like the one thing you're like, I'm super, I mean, super proud of everything. But if you were to drive somebody towards something that is particularly um, meaningful to you in terms of, all right, this is, this is definitely like the pinnacle of what I've done so far. And then also, you know, what is something that, you know, you are potentially like psyched for uh, to eventually, you know, put out on there. Okay, so you won't find it on the channel, but uh -huh. one of the craziest things, I think the, like, it's, it's so funny, this is like such a question I should have like known was coming, <laughs> like, but I, I didn't. Um, so not on the channel, but one of the craziest things I've printed was I got a request a couple of years ago, like back in 2014 or so, um, to 3D print a Pokeball from Pokemon that was gonna be used as an urn for somebody's ashes. Oh my God. And so that was one of the, like, that was something where like, I, there's so much weight in that, right? Like, you, that's something you don't want to mess up. I just want to know, does somebody in the family, like, accidentally pick it up and, like, I choose you, and then grandma's ashes just... That... No, it, it, was, it, was, it was a young person buying it for another young person, and so it was a difficult, like, it, you know, like, as you can imagine, that was a, a tough, weird thing to print. Um, but in terms of weird things, I've made so many weird things, but, like, the, I think one of the ones that I would, um, kind of going back to, like, the, the brain, one of the things I was really proud of, um, uh, a friend of mine had a, a scan done of his abdomen, and he was, like, really concerned how the scan looked. He thought it looked really weird and stuff. And so I wound up printing out his spine and sending it to him as, like, a, a hey, like, everything's cool. Like, your spine is totally normal situation. A totally normal, totally normal thing. Um, Did Konami and, call you to work on the next Mortal Kombat game after this? Oh my God, dude, the, I can't watch those. I started, like, I played Mortal Kombat in the 90s, like every like normal person. And so the fatalities were like, oh, look, you like tore the dude's head off. But now, like when I watch them on YouTube and it goes into like x-ray vision and you see a guy's spleen explode, it's like, <laughs> I get now why like my parents at the time were like, that's awful like that's horrible that's so brutal and i'm like no it's, it's a video game and i watch them now and i'm like all right i, I, I kind of get it <laughs> um I, I don't know you know and in terms of 3d printing in the future right now i'm actually it's funny i'm really focused on 2d printing and so there's a 3d printer back here that i've modified so instead of depositing plastic uh it actually has a pen that's held in a little spring-loaded trap that moves up and down so it it i've built basically a pen plotter and so I've been writing a lot of software recently, and I've like I've got a bunch of stuff here, by the way, that I, I like 
had out as props just in case. Um, and one of the things I've been working on is this software that will take a picture and then it converts it into a bunch of lines. And so like, that's my cat, Virginia. But if you look really carefully, it's just a bunch of lines. That's and then like, it becomes kind of clearer the further out you get. And then the same, this is like a self-portrait. And kind of the closer you get, it's just a bunch of lines. And so what I wrote this little thing, and all it does is it takes a look at a picture, take goes pixel by pixel, converts the pixel into a brightness value, and then changes the, the angle of the line. And so I was, it was one of those things where I was kind of hacking around with it, but I've been having so much fun with it. It is like about, I started doing it in August, and it's like 3D printing has just totally taken a backseat. I'm like, all right, I'm all in on this 2D printing thing. That's crazy. I mean, there's just so many avenues just, you know, with this printing that you can kind of get into and do and the different applications that, you know, you just kind of like blowing my mind, man. I, 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 I'm, for once I'm speechless. So maybe the universe thanks you for that. Um, but, but that, that is absolutely crazy. So you're just going to kind of get into a little bit more on this 2D space. Yeah. So I'm playing around with the pen plotter. I thought it was kind of a fun thing. And it's, it's a lot of fun for me because I'm not a software engineer. It's not something I've really done in the past. Um, it's every like year I dust off my book on like how to learn Python and like, I'll do a little bit of programming and then I get frustrated. and like, I'll put it aside. But over the past, um, God, nine months now, I guess, you know, since sort of since lockdown is kind of encroached on everybody's lives, I finally had the time to sit down and say, all right, I'm really going to learn this and I'm going to, I'm going to do it right. And so I've been playing around with processing a programming language that I played around with a little bit in college. And I've, I've, it's mostly, it's aimed at like graphic designers and artists and it's sort of like a soft language. Yeah. Um, and I've been having a lot of fun with that. And it's, you know, the past two years or so have been a lot of travel. I spent, I've gone up and down the East coast, um, traveled. I've been to like every type of factory from like, factories that do food packaging to fire extinguishers to like whatever and and in the past couple of months i've had all of this time to like sit down and say okay i'm not traveling i've got time to like really do like a deep focus on some of these hobbies and so that's turned into this um uh all these weird ideas that have kind of come out like the, i think one of the last videos i did was something i've you know again i've been doing this for like eight-ish years the STL file is like the generic 3D printable file, but it just never occurred to me, like, what if I open it in Microsoft Word? Like, what is an STL file? Like, what is a JPEG? I don't know. Let's, like, let's find out. And like, I've got all this time on my hands. Let's do it. And so that kind of led into, I like took apart an STL. I'm like, oh, it's a bunch of triangles. And then this is how they're connected. And here's the math behind it and stuff. And then I made a little video explaining it. And like half the comments were like, oh yeah, I never knew that. So I've been having a lot of fun doing these deep dives. It's, it's, it sounds like lockdowns have been good for you. You know, a lot of people have just been like, what do I do? And, and you just keep learning more and more skills. It's, it's, it's great. At anything you can't do. Yeah, it's great. And I, I don't, I have complete sympathy and for anybody who's like, I feel like I can't get anything done because I get it. Like if you're stuck at home all day, man, it, it can definitely take a lot out of you. Um, I'm somebody who's never really had a problem like self-motivating and like, oh, I'm going to work on this. I'm going to do that. But like, I know it's not like that for everybody. And so this is really, these nine months have been sort of a blessing in disguise. I moved in with my girlfriend the day before North Carolina started their like lockdown effect. So I like, I moved out of my apartment. We've been dating um, for, I don't know, like eight months, nine months, something like that. And I moved out of my apartment, moved in here. And then like within a couple days, it was like business is closed, bars closed. Nobody can leave their house, you know? And so the past I don't know, nine months, we've been spending tons of time together. And it's like, this is an A, an awesome stress test on the relationship. Like, it's a great way to find out how things are going. Oh, and they're going that, great. All that close time, you really know each other now. Yeah. And like, you're totally locked in. And so I used to travel a lot. And then, and uh, we lived kind of on opposite ends of the city. So we'd see each other like a few times a week. Um, but now it's like, okay, we get to spend a lot of time together. Um, and so that's been a really, between that, that's been like the biggest plus for me. But between that and being able to sit down and really like learn about things that I've wanted to learn for a long time. And so it's been a, a good chance to kind of dive into that. So I keep like looking down. So this is, I just wanted to show, this is uh, back in October, I did this thing called Scantober where I could go on another whole like massive rant about 3D scanning, but I'll condense it into like 15 seconds. And that's 3D scanning is hard. It's harder than 3D printing. So less people do it but it's easier now than ever. And so that's good. 
I just switched to an iPhone. I had a Pixel for like years. Um, and I was like, oh man, there's so many 3D scanning apps in the, in the iOS store. And they're awesome. They're so good. And there's really? so many, like right now you can 3D scan your head and make a like dead on meshed replica for a dollar. Like that's an app that exists. And it's like, I have this to show you. This was one of my first 3D printing projects back in, oh in 2000 something. Um, and it's a scan of my face that was taken from photographs. And a friend of mine worked at Hasbro he went to an art college and he designed action figure heads. Like he sculpted the hair and the face for action figures. And that was his job. And so I sent him this like kind of really bad mesh of myself. And I was like, can you make this 3D printable? And so we went back and forth on it for a while. And he eventually made me this model. This took like weeks of back and forth. You know, there was like, he had to like, there was a hole on the top of my head, all of the hair he had to like sculpt on. And it was just, it was a lot of work. So flash forward to today, and this little guy here, which of course is red, so it's like impossible to see, but this was at 9 a.m. I woke up and I was like, I'll bet I can scan my head today. Downloaded the app, did the scan, had it on the printer, and I was holding it by two o'clock. <laughs> and so it's That's like the, the turnaround time. So compare like weeks of work and it took like a, a guy who designed action figures for a living to make it look good. And now like just with my phone, there's an app that like guides your face and it's like, all right, move the phone up, move the phone down, left, right. And then it goes, ding, and then your scan is done. That is absolutely just mind blowing that, that, that is that simplistic. I didn't know those apps existed on the, on the phones whatsoever. Yeah, no, they're there. It's amazing. And it's just, it's, it's that level of, um, it's why in 2014, I think 3d printing didn't catch on as much because everybody heard about it. Everybody wanted in, um, people were just tripping over themselves to like invest in 3D printing companies and stuff, even though nobody had like any clue what was going on, but they just didn't really catch on because at the end of the day, the 3D printer is only as useful as the person using it. So like, it's, it's sort of like buying any other expensive like tool, like, okay, so you've bought like a miter saw or something, but yeah. you don't know how to use it. It's not going to do anything for you. So people didn't really have a good grasp of how CAD works. So there was less emphasis on 3D design. So the idea, like what, um, you know, me and everybody was um, sort of selling the idea of was you have a 3D printer and you'd say, I want a cup. And then the 3D printer would go, Wah, and then you would just pull a cup out of it. But like you have I to want. design the cup first. <laughs> no, so, no, materialize the, the cup, you know, that, that, that's what we need. Yeah, exactly. And that's like, that's where, like, we're definitely, there have been all kinds of cool, like light and resin machines that do all kinds of like, you know, stupid fast prints and stuff. Um, but it, there's no doubt that we'll get there, but I think it's this generation. I used to teach um, sort of after school, like STEM camps, like summer camps for kids who are interested in 3D printing. And like, I would meet kids in the, you know, third, fourth, fifth grade, and they, they were aware of 3D printing. Like, oh, our library has a 3D printer. What? And so like, and then they're using like MS Paint. You're, you're going to feel this one like right in the chest because it oh. got me pretty good. MS Paint is gone right off the bat. Um, but now there's Paint 3D. Like, MS Paint is just 3D now. You just make stuff in 3D. <laughs> what? <laughs> so it's, you know, seen that sort of, like, generational shift where, like, everyone growing up now, it's, it's – when I first started showing 3D printers to kids when I was doing these, like, STEM camps, it was like, whoa, wow, you can just make stuff. And now you show them a printer, and it, it's like, all right, we're going to make, you know, a cell phone stand, or, like, we're going to make, like, this sort of curvy shape. And you put it in the printer, and, okay, it's going to take 20 minutes. The kids are like, oh, 20 minutes. <laughs> Time is rough. Ah. Yeah. And it's like, this is magic. If you wanted this like 20 years ago, you'd have to carve it out of wood. <laughs> I thought you were going to go a different route with that. I thought you were going to like say, oh, you know, we're going to print this. And then they're like telling you how to better the design and how, you know, like. We had, there was a kid we did for, um, I would do uh, like these like couple week STEM camps. And at the very end, we'd have like a final project. And I'd like print out whatever they made, right? And one of the kids printed a tiny, he had gone to the 3D printer and he used like a, a ruler to measure it, all the different sides and the, the print tray and everything. And he made a little 3D, 3D printer. <laughs> so for his project, he had it like sitting on the bed and he's like, oh, by the way, check this out. And the bed like slid back and forth. I'm like, all right, that's pretty good. <laughs> like That's, that's, that's pretty clever. awesome. It, well, at least at least the future's in good hands because at least that what was once just like mind blowing 
they're grasping and they're interested in. And, you know, like I was saying, even like with uh, my like 12 year old nephew, like younger people are super interested in engineering and 3d printing and 3d scanning. And, you know, at, at once was maybe something more niche is now popularized. So it's only going to further what explode from there. Right. Yeah. And it's just, I, I absolutely think, you know, um, this is the perfect time to ask him what he's interested in. Like, what is it about engineering? What is it about technology that's exciting? Is it, is it like a marriage of sports and technology? Because guess what? Like every golf club company, every basketball company, every company that makes this stuff, they're all using 3D printing and they're all doing yeah. weird. I, I've yet to really meet anybody involved in the creative side of additive manufacturing that like their background was like very hard science. There's always some element of like, oh, well, my, you know, my primary interest is I really love, you know, basketball. And that's what led me to do this sort of texture design. And now my texture design has led me to work for a company that makes metal 3D printers, you know, and you're just like way just from everywhere. That's, that's the next field that you have to dominate. We already, I have seen in the past, Andrew has some latent baseball skills. Done. Oh my God. I forgot about that. <laughs> oh my God. That was so bad. It was so hot that day and I was wearing pants. That was the one thing that blew you. You were wearing like khaki, your khaki pants, I think. Yeah, I was wearing, I didn't have, I like, I had, I don't know why I didn't have shorts. Like, so I used to do um, like powerlifting in college. And so like my body weight fluctuates like 50 or 60 pounds, like seasonally. Like I'm like, I'm, my body is like wrecked from like gaining a bunch of weight and then I lose it all. And then I get really big and I'm really skinny again. So like, I never have like a good pair of shorts ever. They're always either like the super whole, tight. Two shorts. I guess, like, I guess the khakis, I could just, like, hulk it, right? And, like, rip it above the knee or something. <laughs> that would work. But, yeah, I remember playing baseball that day. That was a, that was a warm day, man. <laughs> that was too hot. So, Andrew and I used to work together, and I, uh, I – it's no surprise to anybody. I love baseball. So, we would do, like – I'd organize these little company baseball games where, like, 20 people, 25 people would show up, and we'd just have, like, an impromptu game. I say impromptu, but it took, like, weeks, weeks of planning and uh talking to like henrico county in virginia uh, parks and rec department and just yeah anyway yeah it was like 97 98 degrees i was like in the middle of june or july and just i almost passed out and then somebody who worked with us like went over to like a tree and was like vomiting which is a beautiful story and i know i paid for oh, it i didn't see that <laughs> um it was um i don't want to embarrass the dude but it was uh somebody who worked in our uh, it department uh, at the time. i got gotcha. you it, it was did. hot man I mean, I don't blame them. And the people were like drinking and like alcohol doesn't really like do very much for you. I don't know if I should say that aloud because I don't think you're allowed to have it at the parks there. But anyway, Good yeah, we didn't. We, we did. We, we didn't. A little Jedi mind trick for the day for. Uh, I, I will I will ask this. How close are you to printing? Because I've seen you do some replicas and stuff from like Star Wars ships and things. I need a 3D printed working lightsaber. How far off are we from that? There, that's one of those things where I'll bet you, I'll bet you five bucks right now. You go on YouTube, you find a guy who's got like, who, who put like a hot turkey knife or something on like a 3D printed hilt and made one. There, there is, is, that is like, there has someone is made a one? channel out there where the, I forgot the name of it. And I'm sure somebody in the comments or somebody on social will, will correct me, but there is a guy out there or a team. And all they do is build lightsabers and they're on like the second iteration of it. Um, and they made like one connected to a battery pack, like a proto saber going on. And it does like legitimately, it is, I think it's, I think it's plasma. I don't know what it is. It's like insanely hot. And like one of the first ones they did almost like burnt a whole room down because of the heat the thing generates. Like when I think about that, like like really think about having a lightsaber, I think of that time that you know I'm playing baseball. How many times did I hit my shins with that bat, just walking from like one place to another? If I had a lightsaber, I would within minutes be like for the rest of my life, I would be nine fingered Andrew. Like oh. there's just so much responsibility in something like but that. But then you could three D print a new finger, and you would new have a use for that. So that. <laughs> It all, it all ties back together. It all, the 3D printing and the nerddom and everything else, it all just it all blends in together. There was a guy who 3D printed an extra thumb for himself. I thought it was the coolest thing. He had like a little brace. And then he had, so like you've got you know, your four regular fingers and your opposable thumb. And he had like a brace. And then there was like another thumb. And they were controlled like that. So I he could like grab it. stuff with it. I don't like it. We'll save, we'll save that guy for the, uh, the horror podcast, guys. 
Uh, Andrew, I really have appreciated you talking to me about, you know, everything printing, scanning, your channel, all these fun little stories we've kind of interwoven. Is there anything that I didn't ask or that you didn't get to mention that you wanted to? No, this has been so cool. This is like, I, I really love the idea of, of doing a podcast. I think what you're doing is like, it makes so much sense to have a podcast where you're talking to people from all different backgrounds, right? Because you're, it's always something different. And like every podcast that I listen to when I'm driving is like um, some, you know, Gimlet media. And it's always kind of like the same eight topics, but like slightly different. I love the idea that you've got such a wide range of people coming in. Um, and I'm excited to see what comes up next. I really appreciate it. I think this is going to be the, the last one of 2020 because this will be, um, by the time this is published, it'll be December. We'll be, we'll be staring oh, wow. Christmas down the barrel of a gun. And, um, but yeah, I, I, I genuinely love to learn. Speaking to you was tremendous. You definitely, um, great, easy to talk to, highly entertaining. I wish you the best of luck in your peanut butter and jelly uh, 3D printing endeavors. And again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your, out of your schedule to talk to me and just kind of, you know, ed educate me and make me understand a little bit more about your world. No, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. And there's definitely going to be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the mail for you once I get this thing working. Beautiful. It'll be in a 3D printed envelope from a 3D printed mailman and it'll just be the whole inception loop. It might you be something you like look at, but don't eat. <laughs> you can hold it and appreciate it. I'm still going to eat it unless it says, do, you know, do not eat, not real food. Even then, mm, skeptical. <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much, man. You'll, I'll definitely uh, grab you back on the show at some point in 2021. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Take care. All right. All right, guys. I hope you really enjoyed that episode of Point of Jew. Andrew did just a phenomenal job again of kind of explaining engineering, explaining 3D printing, all those uses and applications and all the stuff you could see on his channel. Um, I will link below. It's one thing I should have done and did not do. I didn't say, hey, you know, where can we watch your videos? But, you know, I am familiar with the channel. So easy thing to uh, pop in the description so you guys can go check out Andrew's videos and see all those things he was talking about uh, that he does print. And hopefully he will put the peanut butter uh, and jelly sandwich video um, on his YouTube channel because that's just that sounds cool and delicious maybe I don't know maybe we can maybe he can send me the 3d printed uh, sandwich and I can eat it in an episode uh, I'm not sure if that's an exciting thing or a weird thing but I'm 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 strangely on board I'm good with it um, did kind of allude to and mention um, in some of the past videos uh, this is going to be the video that wraps up uh, our 2020 uh, kind of taking most of December off just because of holidays and things going on for me, for you, for the world. Um, so we will kick back off in 2021 and I will keep updates on facebook.com slash point of Jew because I'm sure I'll still be active on social and uh, on, on the Twitter at DJ Hirsch 42. And uh, we'll keep those updates and I'll, I'll sneak in some interviews, uh, you know, during that gap so we can kind of hit 2021 running um, still trying to line up some great guests all the time. It's, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to, you know, all the great individuals that we've had on this show, you know, from Andrew, from the engineering aspect of it, um, you know, from speaking to Dice and Shimon Day and um, the guys at Terror and Podnito and, you know, most recently uh, with Jason and with Joe and um, getting to, to get Tommy Siegel on here was absolutely awesome. His music and his cartoons and then Ashley and Brian, you know, uh, just fantastic job in terms of explaining Twitch to me and just been highly entertaining podcasts. And then um, Kevin for coming on here and talking wrestling with me, which I'm pretty sure if I didn't get it, we would have still been talking from them from then to now. And uh, I, I guarantee I have probably forgotten one or two people and I, I, I do immensely apologize, but um Tons of great individuals who have come out on here as I, as I replenish my liquids here. Um, so hopefully we'll keep building on that. If there's guests that you thoroughly enjoyed um, from these past episodes, we'll try and get them again in 2021. I mean, everybody seems to be on board to chat, which is always, always good. Hopefully uh, new material and um, you know, other questions to see in terms of following up because I don't want to be repetitive at least with the content, clearly with this clothes, I'm just going on and on. Um, but I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday season. Um, 
Hanukkah here. So happy Hanukkah to the fellow Jews of Point of Jew. Uh, Merry Christmas uh, to those of that persuasion. Uh, I do Christmas because uh, my wife's Christian, so her family always super nice to me. So I, I, do, I do have some of the, the Christmas spirits. Um, any other holidays that, that fall in there, um, you know, go, go toyota um, what, whatever floats your holiday boat, whatever, whatever gets it going for you. Um, I just want everybody to have a health, happy and healthy and safe holiday season. And, uh, cause I know the first episode will be afterwards. Um, you know, happy new year to you guys. I know 2020 was not the best, but, uh, we'll do whatever we can, you know, 2021 new year, new starts, and uh, hopefully that goes great for everybody. And um, thank you for all the support that you've shown me. I really tremendously appreciate um, anybody who's watched this on YouTube or listened to me on iTunes or Spotify or, or however you digest uh, this media. I, I can't thank you guys enough. I mean, I, I do this because I love speaking to people and I'm looking to entertain myself. And then hopefully by proxy, I'm entertaining you as well. And that's how this circle keeps going round and round. Um, so from DJ Hirsch of Point of Jew, again, uh, have a happy, healthy, and wonderful holiday season. And I will see you guys in 2021. Until then, I got nothing on that. I was just, I, I, I was waiting for something grand always to happen. No, um, until then, um, keep watching, keep looking for updates, and we will do this again next year.